name is Paula Marshall. I'm from the Mi'kmaq community here in Nova Scotia. I have, the last time I did a presentation, I said I had seven sons, seven dogs, and seven grandchildren. But in the past year, we've upped that to 10 grandchildren. Woo! So it just they just seem to be growing, <laughs> taking over. I'm here to talk about Aboriginal culture and customs as it pertains to justice. And I think I'm going to start a little bit about talking about why um, the dominant justice system perhaps isn't working as well for our Aboriginal people and the reasons that we do things a little bit differently. Now we've always had governments, uh, even before the Western Europeans came, we've always had uh, rules of governing society, ways of resolving disputes, um, but we didn't have them documented. And I, I think that has also been a challenge for Western society is because we didn't have anything written down, they assumed we didn't have any. Um, we had very vast and complicated um, relationships and processes that we dealt with with other communities within our own communities. And even when the Europeans came, we also had very vast trading and um, ways of economy of dealing with um, the dominant society. Well, they weren't dominant then. No, they weren't dominant then. <laughs> <laughs> <Still are. laughs> um, and to begin to understand Aboriginal culture, I think we have to talk a little bit first about our, our elders and the role that elders play. Elders, which can be both men and women, and though we assume elders are seniors, seniors and elders aren't the same thing. Our elders are our teachers, they're our knowledge keepers. They're the ones who, through life experiences, now have the right to show the rest of us, and through stories, usually, on the most appropriate way of doing things. This is really challenging within the dominant justice system, as elders don't have a role. And it is all based on employment, who, who has the job rather than who has earned the position that they're in through the community. One of the most complicating factors for our people is that we're dealing with two, two world views. And um, an obvious example of this would be in, in even pleading guilty. In our communities, uh, well, in Western society, the dominant culture, pleading guilty is seen as a right. You can either plead guilty or not guilty, and there's nothing seem to nothing wrong with that. In our culture, by pleading guilty, you're not being honest, and that's seen as being disrespectful because in our community it's about relationships. So by pleading not guilty, you're going against the culture. You're going against what our elders and communities and the values that they're teaching you, and that. Um, we see a lot of Aboriginal people going through the justice system that just enter plea, guilty pleas, and they don't even speak to a lawyer. One of the programs that we have is the uh, Mi'kmaq Court Worker Program, and through the Court Worker Program, we ensure that Aboriginal people going through the court system have an opportunity to talk to a lawyer and understand their um, rights within the dominant justice system so that it's okay to plead guilty and uh, it, you know, it, there's different mitigating factors, but in our communities there isn't mitigating factors, either you did it or you didn't. So that's always a challenge. The meaning of justice is understood differently by Aboriginal um, people. Uh, the dominant society tries to control actions it considers potentially dangerous or harmful through um, punishment or by um, enforcement, apprehension, and in our communities, the the purpose of the justice system is seen to restore peace. It's seen to restore harmony and restore relationships. So that's very different from the dominant justice system. Our concepts of justice are very different as well. In the Canadian Criminal Code, it's a huge list of rules that you must not break. And in our communities, it's a, not so much a list of rules, but uh, maybe a list of values that you are not supposed to break. 
Um, our, in our um, communities, we have the seven sacred teachings. And they are, I know I wrote them down somewhere because I know I will forget. Judy will have to help me when I can't remember them. Um, the seven sacred teachings include honesty, humility, sharing, respect. Um, help me, Judy, what are the other three? Love, Love wisdom, and... Yes. How come you know and I don't? <laughs> And these values are the values that govern our relationships and our involvement with other communities and other people, and, and through kinship as well. And this is very different from the dominant society, which values independence, financial security, um, competitiveness. All of those are contradictory to the values that we're trying to teach our children. We also have smaller rules within our communities that affect how we deal with people. We have the rule of non-interference. So if somebody does something wrong, it's not our responsibility to try to correct them. So if a law is broken, it's not our responsibility to go and hold them accountable. It's their family's responsibility to hold them accountable. If we see that the person is misbehaving, we use social controls such as lack of a better word, gossip or shaming, to identify what those inappropriate behaviors are. And no one wants to be the center of that, um, but we're not allowed to go and tell them that they're doing wrong, which is challenging. Parents allow children to make mistakes. In dominant culture, this is seen as lack of parenting skills. We allow our children to go and make mistakes. We allow our children to go and experiment. We even allow our, our, our older children to go and make mistakes because that's all about learning. And every event in your life is a learning experience. And that's what we have been taught. We teach lessons through stories. So if you ever have an elder in your circle um, or in your process, you're going to hear lots of stories. Sometimes you have to be really creative to kind of wonder what was the point of that. But there is always a story, and it's also interpretive. So you can kind of sometimes make up whatever is appropriate at the moment. Um, kinship is very important in our communities, and it's a responsibility of the of kids and your family members, your extended family, to be responsible for your behavior within the community. For larger infractions, it may go to the Grand Council, or it may go to a larger community group. Historically, there was a feast called Wigabaltik. Wigabaltik was a New Year's feast, but not on the, the traditional calendar New Year's. It's held in um, February. And it was an opportunity where, like Judge Barry said, we had food, we always have food, and there would be a feast. And at the end of this feast, they would do the Abixik Dom, which is the forgiveness piece. And forgiveness isn't even a word that can be actually translated well into English, because forgiveness is something mutual. It has to go two ways. So a wrongdoer has to forgive a person of harm, as well as the person of harm has a responsibility to forgive the wrongdoer which is very challenging, and very, um, especially with dominant culture where the victim is not asked to be responsible to forgive. But in our communities, in order for survival of the whole community, every person had a responsibility to forgive for wrongdoings, even the unintentional ones. We also have values of non-competitiveness. Um, this is just to show that we have a more cooperative approach. In our communities, if someone is pushing too hard or pushing too far, it's seen as something negative. It's not seen as if they're a go-getter. So we, we, we try to promote um, humility in all our communities. Another problematic um, thing for Aboriginal people is emotional restraint. We are brought up many times not to show strong emotion. Uh, this is difficult within the court system where you're expected to cry when you're guilty or you're expected to show you know, tears of remorse. But in our communities, you are to look down, because eye contact is not appropriate either, and be humble when you're in a position of um, being chastised or being, not the word is judged, I don't know how to say it in English. And 
we see this as a challenge because a lot of people, Aboriginal people, have identified through research and through people that have been in the Canadian criminal justice system that complicated grief and unresolved grief issues are very challenging for them and are the causes of many of their social um, behaviors or the wrongful behaviors because they've never had an opportunity to express them. And a lot of times we see challenges with addiction because of many times under the influence of alcohol, they are more able to express those emotions. So what are some of the things that we're doing? Um, I'm very proud to say that with the support of Judge Pam, um, Chief Judge Pam Williams and uh, Judge Lori Hatpin in the court, we are looking at the first healing court for the Mi'kmaq communities here in Nova Scotia. I do have to say my colleagues in New Brunswick already beat us to it, and Elsie Bokduk has the first Mi'kmaq Aboriginal court in um, Atlantic Canada. We also uh, work with, one of the things that Murray Sinclair said yesterday is that through Section 718 in the Gladue decision, there is supposed to be an opportunity for the judges, it's legislation that judges must consider the special circumstances of Aboriginal people. All of the systemic factors like residential school, the 60s school, um, addiction, suicide, poor housing, um, overcrowdedness, all of those things have to be taken into consideration. But we don't really have a tool to bring that information forward other than a Gladue report. And here in Nova Scotia, we're very fortunate to have the support of the provincial government to provide Gladue reports for judges that are sentencing Aboriginal people. And our colleagues from PEI now are also doing our Gladue reports for the courts as well. Spirituality is also a very important part of the processes that we use. Spirituality, we begin with a smudge, we have an opening prayer. A lot of times many of our people are asked to go through a, a, um, a sweat lodge ceremony or a burning ceremony, the keeper of the sacred fire. A lot of these things that we're trying to incorporate and bring back to um, our people who have never experienced it. What I want to say about restorative justice and many have heard me speak over in our group the last couple days. This isn't a program. This isn't a process. Mm -hmm. This is how we do things. This is how we live. Our program is not a restorative justice program. Our program is based on the customary laws of Mi'kmaq people here in Atlantic Canada. And our program is the customary law program. Because this is the way we live. This is the way we are expected to behave and treat each other within our communities and outside of our communities. So with that, I hear a lot of uh, words of new wave and let's move forward and new approach. It ain't that new. Um, I've been doing this for 20, over, I won't say how many years, but over 20 years. And I'm new at this, but it's been around for a really long time. And what we need to do as people here in Canada is to try to bring those principles of sharing and respect and the things that we've had and that are intrinsic to humanity, I believe, in the business that we do every day, not just in our practice of employment or our chosen careers, but also in the ways that we deal with each other. Thank you.